Welcome back to a story to tell from the campus of Dixie State University. I'm Lane Ronner, and we're talking today with Hubert Moose. Is that correct? That is correct. Hubert, how are you doing? I'm just doing fine. You look fantastic. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you came from, what you've done. Well, I uh, was born on the island of Java in the city of Bandung, uh, not too far from the now Jakarta, it was Batavia before. And uh, uh, my father was uh, in the Dutch military. He's a European, he's a Hollander. And my mom is uh, kind of, you may say, uh, Indonesian, not complete, but mixed. And uh, I lived in, uh, in Indonesia for until uh, after the war and moved to the Netherlands in, in 19, uh, what is it now? It was 1817. When was the war over? I forgot. Was that in 19, that was in 1945. 1947. So 1947, we moved to Holland. I lived in Holland for approximately 12 years, joined the Dutch Air Force for eight years, and uh, left the Air Force. And uh, I had the opportunity to uh, moved to America because we had an American squadron at our air base and I was quite involved with these people and uh, I um, later on in 1960 I collapsed in Amsterdam was taken to the hospital and I was in pretty bad shape the doctor told me that I supposed to quit drinking and smoking because my kidneys and my liver were in pretty well damaged. And uh, I said, well, that's a hard thing for me to do. And he says, well, then you have six to eight months to go. Six months, to, six to eight months to live. To live, he says, and uh, so I got a little nervous. At that time, I needed to quit, and I did. And uh, in the meantime, I joined the LDS Church. And then, instead of immigrating to the United States, I went to a church building uh, program or mission, if you will, for two and a half years. I built uh, a chapel in Brussels, Belgium, and I built an, another one in Amsterdam, Holland. Met my, met my wife, and then in 1963, uh, we moved to the United States. And I've been living here in Utah since then. Do you like Utah? I love it. How did you pick Utah? I didn't pick Utah. I had no other choice because you're supposed to have a sponsor, somebody that uh, takes care of you for the first five years, and uh, they lived in Bountiful. And so I had to fly to Salt Lake City and picked up by these people in Bountiful and uh, I start my life actually here in Salt Lake City and start to work for him and he had a letter setting business which was not my line of work but uh, the first two weeks uh, after the first two weeks he asked me he said would you like to stay with me or would you like to go in your line of work? And since I'm in the electronics and uh, mechanical engineering, I chose to uh, go in that kind of work. And so I work in 
in a company that uh, had sales in uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, <coughs> furniture and they had also the television and uh, refrigeration and this kind of uh, thing and so I lived for the I worked for them for nine years before I start my own business what business was that and that was repairing electronic <coughs> devices and my specialty was biomedical electronic electronics so and I specialized in brain scanners and respiratory analyzers some people say I need a brain scan <laughs> I, I can do the scan, but I can tell you what, <laughs> tell what the what problem you is. <laughs> tell me about your experience in World War II. You were really young then. I was really young. I was born in uh, 1932. The war broke out uh, after Pearl Harbor, and that was in March uh, uh, 1942. And I was then 10 years old. Uh, to make it short, we were picked up approximately four, maybe six months after uh, the Dutch East Indies surrendered to the Japanese and uh, we were put in concentration camps. I was with uh, my brothers and sisters and my mother, my dad was a prisoner of war and uh, not long after that I was picked out because I was 10 years in, cons in consideration with the Japanese. Uh, 10 years old, you are just beginning to be an adult. You're an adult at 10 years of age. Yeah. And so we were uh, then uh, picked, up, picked out and put into a work camp with in a, in a monastery, a monastery and a school, and we were there with about, uh, well, I would say, 7,000 7, pe people. people, and uh, men of 65 and older, up to down boys to 10 years old. Must have been a hard life. Well, in the beginning, it wasn't really that bad, but later on, the Japanese were not friendly people at that time. And uh, we did, uh, I worked in the fields, raising crops for them. And uh, the leftovers uh, of what we raised uh, went in, into concentration camps for people to eat. And so uh, later on, when I got older, I uh, was put in more heavier work and I uh, dug trenches and... Uh, and how old were you then? About 13. When you got 13? About 13. Digging trenches at 13. Yeah. And railroad uh, tracks and things like that and all by hand because all the tools that we had was an axe and a hoe. So we moved the dirt with the hole and cut the trees with the axes for the, uh, I have to think how, for the tracks on, on the railroad. Right. Did you have some resentment toward the Japanese? Not anymore. I, I lost it a long time ago, and I'm so glad I did. But I was very, uh, well, I would say very upset, especially with one particular uh, Japanese officer. We formed a line and moved all kinds of material, rocks and so on, we were about 10 feet apart and we just picked up the rock and threw it to the next one. And it happens to be that uh, this Japanese officer just got this rock on his boot. And that was for one and a half years approximately 
a bad situation because every time that we cross each other and he was smoking, then uh, he burned that smoking cigarette or cigar you know, somewhere on my body. And since we only were dressed in shorts, bare feet, we had nothing else than... You actually extinguished the cigarette or cigar yeah. on your skin? All over the place, yeah, my arms and my skin. And uh, I, I developed such a hatred in him uh, I mean, with him, uh, that, uh, can you imagine, I was just, just about 13, 14 years old, that I was just looking at his samurai, which he carries so, next, yeah. Yeah, next to him, to pull it out and stick it in his belly. It was that bad. You couldn't cry when he just burned, burned me with his cigarette, and otherwise he'd just slap you in the face, and so... That is what I had to experience uh, for about, an, I would say, in a year and a half. Were there any good experiences with the Japanese? Yes. I run into a commander, and that was the last three months of the war that we were in concentration camp in May, June, July. And he was a decent fellow. And uh, I was working in the field, and all of a sudden I was told to, uh, to see, see this Japanese uh, commander. And that is not a good thing. So you, you were in deep trouble, I guess, and, or deeper trouble. Yeah, and so uh, that was not a good thing. And so uh, I was given a bar of soap and uh, to clean myself and take a shower. And uh, well, my clothing, I mean, that was all I had. I was so dirty and everything. And so I was told to see the nuns that were in our camp. They took care of the sick in the hospital and to uh, just see if they have something for me to wear that's clean. And, and so uh, <coughs> they gave me another short and that was clean. I cleaned myself and I went to this commander's office and I bowed like I normally do. And he stood up and he said in broken uh, Malayan, uh, you, seven day, no work. And he repeated that several times and I don't know what he was talking about. And finally it uh, came to me, the seventh day, well, my parents were Seventh-day Adventists. And so uh, he, uh, when I said yes, or in Malayan, Sayat to one, he smiled and he got his hands in his pocket and he pulled out a little package and gave it to me. And he says, this is from your mother, I met her. She was in another camp? Yeah, she, uh, she was in an, another concentration camp. And so my job then was to take care of his uh, needs, like uh, polishing his boots and keep his uh, clothes uh, in, in, in good condition. And uh, what he did is he got a mattress for me in his room and that was my place to stay. The next day, he had three pair of clothes, clothing for me, shirt and pants and, and, uh, and sandals. And so my job was to uh, set his table for his meal and uh, of course clean it too. He, is, he was getting officer's dinner so not the same as the soldiers were. 
And uh, so the first time it shocked me a little bit because I was standing about 10 feet away from the table and uh, he showed me this chair there to take that to the table which I did and uh, sat down and he said in here in broken Malayan that uh, I was going to eat with him and from now on and so he said his prayers and so on and so I felt pretty nice at that time and have good meals and I gained weight pretty fast. The leftovers of his meals I took and took that into the camp and shared it with seven other buddies of mine. We had a group of eight that were looking after each other and so I was pretty popular. I bet you were at that time and so uh, that stayed that was about I would say about three three and a half months and then all of a sudden he was gone and uh, he didn't say anything that he was leaving and so on and I until this day well he doesn't live anymore because at that time he was somewhere in the 40s I really wanted to meet him again and uh, that was the, the nice part of that situation. Did it affect you or how did it affect you being in the camp that way? Well the hatred that I built up internally was so severe towards people with split eyes you know and uh, it affected me quite a bit because I was just not a normal young man and in Holland when I went to Holland I just didn't like people and I had a hard time hard time dealing with people dealing with people you see I learned my skills and so on I went to school and so on that everything was just just fine but I had really a problem in communicating because of this resentment you had yeah so and that uh, took a long time until I run into President Matsumori who was uh, you say president he was your stake president yeah, he was my stake president at that time. He was installed there at that moment, and I took care of the electronics and taking uh, movies in the, in the stake. And uh, while I was uh, filming everything, and all of a sudden he was introduced as President Matsumori, I really got a shock because it was a Japanese. Now you were a member of the church at that time? I was a member of the church at that time. And it, even at that late date in your life, they still had this yeah. resentment. And so uh, he was wonderful. And uh, we had a good situation, the two of us. After approximately, I, I thought it was 10 years, but it could be, have been eight years that he was state president that I worked with him. We were both released and at that morning, he uh, approached me, it was five o'clock in the morning when I was setting up all the electronics and so. Uh, thanked me for my service to the stake and to him and so on. <laughs> Well, I couldn't help it, but we hugged each other and, and we both cried. And uh, from that time on, I would say things changed. 
Not 100% because I lost my first wife and then my second wife. And then after so many, after 10 years, my third wife, she couldn't uh, stay and, and then uh, that was my problem. I, I was trying to find out what I could do just to keep that marriage going because I had two children with her. With your third wife. And so uh, after hard work and a lot of help, I came to a point that I was able to drop it completely. And I became just like I'm now, having a lot of fun and... <laughs> Life's not very fun if you're not having fun. Yeah, you sure. know that better than anyone, I'm sure. Yeah. So my life started to change and there was another uh, man involved and he was a... Uh, in the military in, uh, 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 where is it now, in, I think you have to help me here, in the islands where we were. It wasn't the Dutch, was it? No, it was American. Uh, well, anyway, in the Pacific, anyway. He was taken prisoner there. He was also a prisoner. Yeah, he was a prisoner there, military, and he walked the dead, uh, the dead march, and uh, later on ended in uh, in Japan. Worked in the coal mine, and well, anyway, he became a member of my ward, and immediately we became friends. And he was trying to tell me, or trying to guide me in the fact to drop it. Drop. Because he did right away. And uh, you, Now, was that the Bataan march? Yeah. That was horrible. It was. And, uh, and he was dropping it, encouraged you to drop it. Yeah. And there's some pictures in that book about that. And so he worked with me, and uh, Metsamori worked with me. And so that brought me actually to this point that I was able to drop it completely. You say they worked with you. They probably, the way they worked with you was by example. Yeah. Example is the best thing. They were my best friends, actually, you know. You know, I'm not that much younger than you are. And I think back of my growing up at the same time when you were in the camp and so forth and how easy we had it here. And uh, my father was involved, and, uh, but it was a totally different life. And it's a really pleasure to meet you and talk with you and hear your story. Your children, you had three wives. Yeah, I had one son of my first wife I had uh, two sons and a daughter of my second wife. And I had a son and a daughter of my third wife. Are you all still friends? Yeah. I read in the book uh, that you had a big reunion or something a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. And they were all there? They, all, they were all there. Your ex-wives? <laughs> no. Uh, that was uh, later back. I, you know, traveled to Europe uh, often where my first son lived. And I have not met him before he was 47 years old. 47. And uh, actually his wife called me on a Sunday morning and uh, asked me if the name Ronald means anything to me. So my answer was, well, it depends where you're calling from because I know so many um, Ronalds. And then she said, uh, she stated that she was his wife. And then my heartbeat went all the way to 225 beats a minute. <laughs> and uh, 
She gave me her phone number and her address and everything, and uh, she said, next week, Sunday, I will give you another call, same time. And which she did, and immediately uh, she gave the phone to him, and he said, Dad, next Friday, I will be in Salt Lake City. And that was conference weekend. I said to my wife, I says, I bet you they're Mormons too. <laughs> my wife says, I don't think so. I think he needs a kidney. <laughs> and so we got together for the first time. We've got two minutes left. Let's talk. Uh, your story is told in this book, From Dawn Until Twilight. And it's written by Michael C. Campbell that we've talk, I've talked to this morning. This is a fantastic story. How could someone get a copy of this? Well, Mike uh, has uh, put an order in, and uh, he has a few. <laughs> so they are available to us. I don't know what his plans are to have it in maybe in, the, in, in bookstores or something like that, but I, I believe it's going to be more in firesides that uh, we well, be great. Yeah. We've got a minute and 30 seconds left. What's your final word to young people today? Well, I have tried and I spoke to young people in um, grade schools my advice for younger people is, number one, if they ever go in the military, are involved in wars or something like this, be kind to the ones that uh, you capture. That number one. Number two, always keep in mind who you are and keep your mind positive. So you can think, and that's what I did. And so now, after almost 86 years, I'm in good shape. You're in fantastic shape. Well, we've been talking today with Hubert Moose, and thank you very much for being with us on A Story to Tell from the campus of Dixie State University. You have a great story, you're a great man, and you have a fantastic attitude. Thank, Thank you. you very much.